Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. It's uh, 1 o'clock rock, 1 o'clock on Mondays. It's research in Manoa. And today our guest is Pete McGinnis-Mark. He's a researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, HIGP, which is in the School of Ocean, Earth Science, and Technology, SOAS at UH Manoa. I say that right. You got it right. <laughs> Good to be back, Jay, and you always get it right. So the intro is easy. So today we're going to talk about mapping Mars. What a fine topic. Yes, and why? Why do we care about mapping Mars? Apart from just the basic scientific interest, eventually we're going to decide where to send new landers to Mars, and probably in 20 to 30 years, where do we send people? So mapping Mars, you obviously want to look for hazardous areas where rovers may not be able to land, uh, but also you want to send people to the most interesting places. Yeah. So there's nothing to do with the movie. Well, maybe a lot to do with the movie, but <clears throat> I guess, uh, can you tell us what the initiative is? Uh, you know, what, what is it about going to Mars? Who's doing it? How are we doing it? Who's participating in it? What's the effort? Oh, it's truly an international collaboration. For example, uh, the Europeans and the Russians have a spacecraft which uh, was launched last month. Uh, which will arrive at Mars by about next October, October of this year. Um, the U.S. has two rovers which are currently driving across the surface of Mars. There's been a lot of interest from other countries. India has a spacecraft in orbit around Mars at the present time. And the Japanese uh, are also quite interested, and presumably the Chinese as well. But China's mainly focusing on going to the moon at the present time. Mm, that's because it's more strategic. <laughs> could well be, could also be easier. Could be easier, yeah, yeah. Pr presumably, yeah. <clears throat> so why, why do people do this kind of exploration? You know, why, why do we collectively, globally want to go to Mars? What is it in for us? I mean, aside from the philosophical notion of it's there, but what, what... Apart from the Lewis and Clark attitude of exploration's always part of humanity, and you really want to press the next frontier. Um, that is a very it, important thing. It, it also really stresses the technology. Um, if you can get particularly people to Mars, but even if you can land a one-ton spacecraft on the surface of Mars, uh, you know, the, the science, the engineering, the computer programming um, necessary to do that, as well as, say, you know, each of these missions is thousands of people in size, so it's a significant effort. Um, it sort of pushes the envelope in terms of what humanity might be able to do, at least in the short term. Long term, um, you could view it either as, a, say, a, a, a lifeboat for humanity if you wanted to go to Mars. Um, you could find new resources there, which might be of value. Um, but also, you just learn so much more about the solar system, uh, how the landscapes have changed over geological time, which would, again, relate back to the Earth Mars is a changing climate. We see on the moon that we've had a lot of meteorites hitting the surface of the moon. And presumably, in Earth's history, there's been thousands of similar impacts. So you learn something about our uh, environment in the, the inner solar system. I you learn the technology, you learn the geology, the environment, and that helps you back home. Sure, and look at what the Apollo program or the space shuttle program uh, delivered in terms of advanced communications, in instruments, technology. Um, it's a very good but unforgiving environment to develop new technologies. So you want to go to Mars partly because you're searching for paleo life, for example. Are we alone in the solar system, uh, at least in this part of the, uh, uh, the solar system? Or are you trying to find um, something about the changing climate of Mars? Uh, and we know for sure that early in Martian history there was a much thicker atmosphere, maybe shallow seas which were a few hundred feet in depth, um, and trying to piece together what went wrong with the Martian climate at the same time that we're dealing with climate change issues here on the Earth, for example. Very valuable. So you, you, you basically are building up a knowledge base that not only gives you some environmental uh, knowledge about what the inner solar system was like, but also, as I said, you're developing all of this wonderful technology. You're inspiring the next generation of engineers, of scientists, computer programmers to really challenge themselves. It's not easy to land on a planetary surface 
it's not easy to get a rocket to actually travel uh, to, to Mars or to the moon and that sort of thing. So say my name is Pete McGinnis Mark. Just say that for a moment. Poor thing. <laughs> and um, I want to map Mars. And I have data. And I know how to do this. And I know as much as you could know about Mars. But I want to map it. Um, and I want to map it for the benefit of the mission. Okay. So who do I call to say, my name is Pete, and I want to do this for the benefit of the mission? Who do I talk to? Um, there are a variety of groups, but primarily you can either use um, existing data sets, such as are being collected by like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a spacecraft currently in orbit around Mars. It got there in 2007, for example. Or if you're really clever, you put together a proposal to build new instruments, build a new spacecraft, and launch it to Mars. If there are some specific things that you want to map on the Martian surface that, say, a regular camera or a regular spectrometer would be unable to see. You, know, you can fly radars to look beneath the surface. You can fly a gamma ray spectrometer to look at the chemistry of the rocks. You can even map the atmospheric structure, for example. So, and, and we, and we and need to know, but who coordinates these you know, this research, Hitler and Jan, who coordinates that? Um, the main coordinating group uh, is part of the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, the survey has what's called the Astrogeology Branch, and they are located in Flagstaff, Arizona. And the reason they are there is primarily because in the early 60s, they led much of NASA's effort in terms of training the Apollo astronauts and doing some of the analog studies. Turns out they're this is a landform called Meteor Crater, which is formed by a, a meteorite hitting the Earth's surface. And this is a crater that's about 1,000 feet across, so you can understand the geologic process. Similarly, there are young volcanic features there, and volcanism on the moon was all the rage. Uh, uh, so similar, similar terrain. To, yeah. Similar terrain, um, and it's very close to a, a number of the other geologically interesting features, like. Uh, Grand Canyon, for example, or Monument Valley. So very good analogs were close to uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, and the USGS basically got contracts with NASA to train the astronauts and to develop the instruments that the astronauts would use on the surface and basic mapping techniques. And that has continued until the present time. And USGS probably has maybe 20 maps of Mars in process, but at varying stages uh, of completion. <coughs> when is the mission going to take place? Does anybody know for sure? What, when is which mission? The Mars mission. Well, there are Mars missions going all the time. Uh, well, the one that you care about. Uh, I care about them all. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> I all that. They're all great. <laughs> um, but for example, in 2018, uh, NASA is going to be sending the InSight spacecraft, which will land a seismometer to measure Mars quakes on the surface. Uh, as I said earlier, the Europeans have a spacecraft which will send a small probe down to the surface in, in October. October of this year. Uh, the Europeans will send another spacecraft to Mars in 2018. So the initiative involves a lot of trips for a lot of reasons, for a lot of research. To measure different attributes or properties of the Martian mm -hmm. surface. Okay. Uh, NASA's next big mission uh, will be launched in 2020. And about two months ago, you had Sarah Fagens and Anupam Misra and Shiv Sharma on this very show. They are science team members of that particular mission. Uh, so we do not currently know any planned Mars missions beyond the year 2020, but clearly there will be some roughly every two years, which is when the orbits of Earth and Mars allow you to get there quickly. And you can ramp up. You'll have time to ramp up and be ready in all the science you need? Well, we would hope we're ready at any time, but certainly we're developing a more in-depth knowledge of what the Martian surface is like. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about the history of mapping. Sure. Let's go to the first slide. First slide. And of course, uh, the first maps of Mars were actually done using Earth-based telescopes. A guy called Percival Lowell, for example, uh, who also worked in Flagstaff, by the way, uh, could peer through the telescope, and he thought he could see uh, all of these canals on Mars, uh, and you know, little green men, and H.G. Wells wrote War of the Worlds, and all that other good stuff. 
we know for sure that this is not a valid interpretation <laughs> of the Martian surface. Maybe he had astigmatism. But if we, go, if we go to the, the next slide, for example, <laughs> the next slide would show you know, the first spacecraft to actually fly by Mars was Mariner 4 back in 1964. It was launched. Um, and what you can see is part of the disk of Mars. And the, the, the image in the lower left where you've got those little postage stamps Mount of four just went zipping by at high speed, snapping images where you, know, you could only just resolve landforms on the surface of Mars. But as we go to the next slide, we'll see that another spacecraft, this one was uh, launched in 1970, got there in 71, called Mariner 9. This was the first spacecraft uh, to orbit Mars and produce a global map. And the next slide will actually show us, this is a geologic map of Mars, which two guys called uh, uh, Dave Scott and Mike Carr published in 1978. And what we're looking at here, all these garish colors are different rock types, okay? So that you can see that in red are volcanic areas, um, in green at the top is a northern plains, um, and there are big holes in parts of the southern part uh, of the, the planet. These are very large impact craters called Hellas and Argyre, for example. And so Mariner 9 gave us uh, the first global look at the planet um, at a scale of about uh, a kilometer or half a mile per picture element. And so this is the knowledge that we had up until about um, 1995, 1996 sort of thing. So we were working with this kind of data set uh, to try and understand the major processes and the major events in Martian history. Now, I was still at grad school when they published the map, all right? So <laughs> I wasn't personally doing it, but I say we, the, the, the science community, the planetary community um, that was both responsible for flying Mariner 9 and the follow-on mission called Viking. You know, sort of, that's what I did my thesis on, was mapping some craters on Mars because of the Viking mission photographs and that, things like that's that. That's what I want to talk about right after the break. How, okay. how, in fact, you do it. I mean, with the science we have today, today, how do you map Mars? We'll be right back for more after this break. Very Let's good. See. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Network. On Center Stage, every Wednesday at 2 p.m., we talk to artists, artists of all different ilk, playwrights, novelists, poets, um, singers, sculptors, you name it. We've had uh, all kinds of interesting people on, and we always talk about what they do and how they do it. And what I find most interesting, we talk about why they do what they do, the process of art, what it does for us as, and our humanity. I hope that you will come and join us, and maybe you'll get inspired to bring out your creative spirit as well. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Network. We're back, we're live, we're here on Research in Manoa with Pete McGinnis-Mark, who is a researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, HIGP, which is in the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, SOEST, at the University in Manoa. So as we were getting to the really exciting stuff about how you actually map, because it isn't easy, those beautiful maps there, that's old technology. Okay. You have technology now that's way, way far ahead of that, right? right. So this is going to be a tutorial for everyone, OK? Basically, we're going to go through some of the simpler parts of how do you actually work from a satellite image to produce one of those intricately detailed maps. So if we could have a first slide. <laughs> Here is the easy part, OK? Um, what we're seeing is part of the surface of Mars where there are two contrasting terrain types or landforms, okay? And I've labeled them younger lowlands at the top of the image, 
There we go, younger lowlands. You can see that there are not too many circular holes and the sun shining from the right hand side. So those are indeed holes as opposed to domes. And then the bottom part of the map, you've got something that's been busted up by uh, tectonic processes as well as many more large holes in the ground. Okay, so and what... And that's an elevation. That, that shadow shows you that you've got mountains over there. That is in elevation, but more importantly, it's an indication of different ages of the landscape, all right? Because if it was all, all the same age, you'd have the same number of craters per unit area on the northern lowlands as you have in the older uh -huh, yeah, highlands, uh -huh. okay? So at a very simple level, what one would do is draw a line sort of that follows around the boundary between the two. And you could then, if you really wanted to, you could have little circles around where all the craters are or the fault lines and that sort of thing. Okay, so that would be an intrinsic property of the Martian surface. And you do this over the entire planet, okay? You're picking out things which look relatively old from things which look relatively young. And, and that's really the, the basis of photogeology. You're trying to put landscapes into a relative sequence of young, intermediate age, and old age. Why? Because then you know which came first. And we'll, we'll get to this uh, okay. in a minute, okay? And now, these are photographs from a satellite. Yes. How, how far away was the satellite from, from Mars when they took... Women? Typically, this satellite orbits at an altitude of about 320 kilometers or maybe 220 miles up. Very okay. good lenses, it, it, very good telescopes. Ah, this is, no, this is junk in comparison to the current oh, okay, spacecraft. Okay. The, the current spacecraft could actually recognize this table. If there wasn't a roof above us, <laughs> the current spacecraft routinely takes images of the rovers that are working on the Martian surface. So uh, it's got a spatial resolution of 25 centimeters. But if you sort of, you want to look at objects about a meter in size, that's about the smallest. Uh -huh. and, and what we were seeing in that image, the scale that area was over a thousand kilometers in width. So, you know, that particular spacecraft had a, a not very sophisticated camera. But as we go to the next slide, for uh -huh. example, okay. what we can see also is that to do part of our mapping, we're not only interested in the regular photograph, but here we're seeing a topographic map of Mars wherein the colors actually represent different elevations. All right, and the, the scale bar on the right-hand side goes from minus eight kilometers to plus eight kilometers. So a mountain of the, eight kilometers high. And as you can see, there's, there's one big dot going to just to the top left of center. That's called Olympus Mons, and that's a volcano that is actually 22 kilometers above what would normally be sea level on, on Mars, but there's no water there's no there right sea. now. What, what is, how do you, you have to construct sea level? Then. You do indeed. So it's sort of an average of, that, that, of the well, lowlands? Well, um, what you do is, as the spacecraft's in orbit around the planet, you figure out where the center of mass of the planet is. Yeah. And it's just like you're calculating the geoid. Yeah. James Foster, when he was here, yeah. told you all about the geoid and how that is the reference for the, the center of the Earth. Well, the same is true with Mars. You put a spacecraft in orbit around any planet, you know what the gravity field is, you know where the center of mass is. And then that topographic map is simply the range of elevations above that center of mass or a certain radius of the planet. And it's organized in a convenient manner so that you know, some elevations are, are slightly below and some elevations are slightly above. How do you tell the topography? How do you tell that it's eight kilometers over, quote, sea level? I mean, it's just a picture, Duck right? Soup. What, what you do is you put a, a high precision laser altimeter on board your spacecraft and then that laser fires straight down to the surface and because you know where the spacecraft is you can measure the time delay from the transmission down to the surface 
back up to the surface so precisely that some really smart people, Dave Smith and Maria Zuber at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, flew that instrument. They can tell you the elevation to probably within 10 centimeters or about four inches. All right, so you can produce globally out of about half a billion laser shots, you can tell which places are high and which places are low. So if we go back to that color photograph, for example, what you could also do is you can see, all right, there's blues and there's reds. Those reds are a volcanic plateau. Uh, down at the bottom right, there's sort of a, a blue circle with green surrounding it. That's a giant hole in the ground. That's a, base, a, a large meteorite crater called Hellas. And that's a super old basin. You can see cutting through uh, in the middle of the image, cutting through the red areas, there's that blue and green channel. That's a giant canyon system that's bigger than the width of the continental so United interesting. States. So if you were to map something like this, yeah. you would combine the image with the topography. But what's more, if we go to the next one, uh -huh. We can also fly, again, this is the parochial we, you know, yeah. a guy called Phil Christensen from Arizona State built a camera that is an infrared camera, and that measures the surface temperature of Mars, both during the daytime and the nighttime. And this image is of exactly the same area Interesting. At, during the daytime and during nighttime. Now, as you know, when you do your barbecue each weekend, <laughs> if you've got little small coals, they can change temperature very quickly. If you've got a big piece of coal, it changes its temperature very slowly. So what we're seeing on the right-hand side, all the bright areas are relatively hot parts of the surface. That means it's rocky. All the dark areas have changed temperature very quickly. That's fine Martian dust. So here's another way of looking at the surface of the planet. Basically, we can say, all right, which parts of the surface are very rocky, which parts of the surface are very dusty? All right, so again, you can discriminate <laughs> a with a different it. instrument. Now, th these, you got these multiple instruments, multiple Space cameras. Cars, you got a laser cam camera. Yeah, lasers. You got a, a, th a thermal camera, thermal yes, uh, infrared yes. camera. It's a spectrometer to give you so rock composition. All looking down from the satellite at essentially the same part of the planet and taking different readings yes. about the same mm, area in the planet. Correct. And giving you kind of cross-sectional information. Not, not cross-sectional. Uh, you would need to have a long wavelength radar which can peer beneath the surface. Oh, yeah, that's another, yeah. So we do have that kind of instrument. You can see Both what's below. The US and the Europeans have each flown a very long wavelength radar that can peer beneath the surface to a depth of about a kilometer. So we can tell if there are layers of ice beneath a dust veneer. We can look for buried lava flows. We can look at the polar deposits, for example. You know, it, it strikes me, Pete, that, that you, you have to test all this stuff somewhere. You can't just fly it out to Mars. Right. And that means you have to test it yes. here on Earth. Yes. It must be very interesting to make the analysis using these various, uh, you know, instruments about and what's here on Earth. And indeed, <laughs> particularly Kilauea and the Big Island, yeah. since the early 1980s, has been one of the primary test sites for all of these instruments. You know, we flew imaging radars on the shuttle in 84 and in 94. We've flown laser altimeters over Kilauea. We do thermal measurements almost all the time. So, so as we perfect these instruments, we could use them also here. Oh, yeah. We can tell a lot about the Earth, and including civilized parts of the Earth. Right. Cities, for example. And, and uh, you know, what we were talking about offline, many of these instruments are now being miniaturized so you can fly them on drones. Yes. So, and, and that adds a new dimension because some parts of any planet, but Earth in particular, is dynamic. So you really want to come back every day or every hour to look at the the changes. 
let's just take a look at the last yeah, slide sure, for this yes, segment. Yes. And what we'll see is also, you know, there's a basic technique that one follows in mapping. As I said earlier, we try to figure out what's old and what's young. Uh, and here we're seeing in five different panels, we've got a, a, a purely random image of the landscape of Mars. And the panels B, C, D, and E basically show our, the interpretation we have. We started off with the oldest landscape, which is in blue. And then as we go into panel C, there's a slightly younger unit, which is in green. And then as we go to panel D, we see that, oh, there was a meteorite crater form. That's the orange bit. And you've got some purple channels, which are lava channels. And then as you go to panel E, which is the youngest, that's when you get these young lava flows. So this is, again, the, the key thing which a, a, a Mars mapper would look for, is what part of the landscape is young and what part is old. Now, we don't know for sure how, what is the age of the young unit and what is the age of the oldest unit. We can make inferences because we've been to the moon and we've got lunar samples, and Jeff Taylor's told you all about this, and we can extrapolate it to Mars. And so we think that the youngest areas on Mars are probably about a billion years old, and the oldest parts on Mars are probably about four billion years old, just in general terms. And you build up what's called a stratigraphic column, right? So you've got the oldest at the bottom, then you've got slightly younger, and the youngest at the top. And then that helps you do a comparison between one area of the planet and a different area. It's like when uh, geologists started to map Utah and the Arizona and so forth, or a uh, Hutton back in the European, uh, you know, like in the 1780s to 1830s, they were trying to understand what the distribution of rock types was as a function of age. We do exactly the same trying to map not only Mars, but the Moon and any other planet which has a solid surface. We're getting better at it. And we have, we have maps. We haven't really shown them the maps. Correct. So we're going to take a short break so everybody can get ready to see the maps, the actual product of all this instrumentation and reading and data here on Research in Manoa. We'll be right back with Pete McGinnis-Mark, and we're going to see the maps. A map. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and one of our delights is to be partnered with Think Tech Hawaii and produce programs every week. Every Monday at 2 o'clock, we have a show called Ehana Kako, which means let's work together. So we bring people from all across the nation and the country, and certainly throughout the islands together here to talk with them about how to work together, and how to work together to do the following, to build a better economy, a better government, a better society. So if you're interested in the research of our think tank, the Grassroot Institute, or if you're interested in how that's applied at the governmental and community and business levels, you'll enjoy the fascinating conversations with our guests on Ehana Kako every week on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock on Mondays. Until our next show, I'll see you. <laughs> Aloha. One. Bingo, we're back at the 1 o'clock rock in the third segment of our show. And you know, before we get to the actual, I'm gonna hold them for one minute more, yeah? On tenter hooks, um, mm. the instruments, you have them, you test them, you know them, you look at them, you work them, you improve them right here in Hawaii. Uh, certainly some of the instruments we actually design and build here at Manoa University, Hawaii. Uh, others, we collaborate with investigators from the mainland. We're on NASA science teams, and particularly a lot of the geology um, teams that NASA have come to Hawaii to test their instruments predominantly on Kilauea, sometimes on Mauna Loa, uh, on the Big Island. So Rob Wright is building a wonderful thermal camera which um, would first fly on an aircraft over Kilauea, and then if it's successful, he'll miniaturize that and fly it on a satellite in Earth orbit. But then another guy, Paul Lucy, is actually trying to fly the same kind of instrument around the moon. So that Hawaii engineers and scientists have, you know, there's this path towards getting into space, getting to the point where 
Hawaii instruments could actually be used to map Mars or yes, the moon. Yes, of course. Um, but certainly NASA and some of the European countries come to Hawaii with their own instruments, collaborate with us or with other people, and basically learn how to make the instruments work properly, how to interpret the data, and then what kind of science can you get out as an end result. I'll bet that some of those big drones I saw at the National Association Broadcaster Show last week would work for you. Indeed, uh, yes. When is your birthday, Pete? I want to get you <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, I, and indeed, um, you know, we collaborate. The main NASA field center that does the drone work is NASA Ames, uh, Moffett Field, just south of uh, San Francisco. You know, they have flown um, drones, predator drones out here with imaging radar systems, for example. Um, they're hoping to fly again as underflights for satellite missions. So a key thing is you have the satellite in Earth orbit looking down either a drone or a manned aircraft below you, and then you have people on the ground to give you that nested appearance yeah, yeah, of, yeah. of what the surface it's is Two like. levels, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and you, uh, for Earth, it's the temporal variability, not only in terms of uh, one day to the next, but also time of day. You know, with dynamic phenomena, not just active volcanoes, but whether it's ocean currents, or you're looking at coral reefs, uh, or even how, say, uh, biota, uh, e ecosystem responds. When do you make the measurements? Do you make them at noon? Do you make them early in the morning? Late after? So that's the sort of thing we try to It's really to exciting. There's so many possibilities. And it, it's it strikes sure me working for what you're doing now is going to be so useful on Earth as yeah. we go. Yeah, it sure beats working for a living. <laughs> <laughs> that's another show. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the rest of your slides. And sure, see yeah, yeah. Maps. All right. So, so uh, the third segment. I'm going to show just an example. And this was a geologic map which I produced for the US Geological Survey, um, which was published last year. A and it focuses in on a small area of Mars. What we're looking at is basically a, a single image, a single photograph of a meteorite crater that is about uh, is 28 kilometers or maybe 20 miles across. So it's smaller than the Wahoo, but it's still fairly large. So that's the circular feature in the middle of this image. And then you can sort of see all the petals of material which sort of seem to radiate away from the crater uh, out towards the edge of, of the image. We're interested in this kind of landform because in digging the hole which represents the crater, the projectile produced a hole that's probably about three miles deep. Okay, so it cut through a whole series of layers. Some of those layers probably contained either water or ice at the time the, the crater was formed. And it basically threw out the material surrounding it. Splashed it out. Yeah. Splashed it out. That's in contrast to the craters that we see on the moon, the moon's dry completely, where all of the material was just thrown ballistically out of the hole. On Mars, it's like a mud slurry, and so it, sort of, it splashes mud on the surrounding lands, and then the mud flows radially away. Yeah, you can tell from the picture of it. Good. You can, yeah. All right, so oh, you're being, Even me. Even, <laughs> you would then be, if we go to the next slide, that is a simplified version of the geologic map that I produced for the US Geological Survey. And you can see in blues and purples, that is the hole in the ground, that's the crater. But then in sort of muddy brown and greens and oranges, you map out the distribution of the landforms associated with the crater. And then in light blue, you've got all of the surrounding landscape. So the whole area before the projectile hit to form the crater the whole area was light blue, and it's an old series of lava flows, okay? Ah. And so what we were trying to do is to study not only uh, the crater itself, but also how all of that muddy material uh, was spread out. Uh, and this is a particularly interesting crater because we know um, from samples that Linda Martell br brought back from Antarctica and people like that, that there are Martian meteorites which seem to have very similar ages 
to some of the landscape which we see here in this crater, in this image. So the speculation is that we actually do have on Earth some of the rocks within which this crater formed. But it's this mapping process where you basically sort of try to define individual geologic units and you try to define what the sequence of events were. And if we go back to the image I'll just show you in, in the next slide, you can see the square, the black square. The next one... Wait, before you go there, now the, 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 the sort of brown-orange The brown color, is, was that the original projectile? No. What was, what was that? No. Why is that raised that way? It's raised because the, what's called the ejector, the material thrown out of the crater, is called ejector. And when it la first landed, it started to squirt across the landscape, just like a high-speed landslide. Yes. Okay? And for some reason, the movement of that landslide stopped. It's like pushing a, a carpet against the wall. The, en the leading edge stopped, but it was caught up from behind, and it just built up sort of ridges or ramparts uh, to produce it. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be there? Oh, I'll to stand at the rim of that crater and don't that tell that. my wife. My my <laughs> wife does not want me to go there and do any field. This would be one of the candidate places that I, you know, you'd learn so much more about how these mud layers were deposited and, and what the detailed layers in the wall of the crater and, and whether or not some of these craters produce temperature anomalies that persist for hundreds of thousands of years. So you could have had a hot spring in the middle of the crater. And if we go uh, one slide, here we are. This is that black square area. And so you can go into excruciating detail that I won't bore the viewers with. No, but each, but each picture gets better. <laughs> each picture here shows the level of detail that the US Geological Survey map. And I produced this map is at a scale of one to 200,000. Now, if you get a Van McNally map or something like that, it's much better, it's at about one to 24,000. Uh -huh. But we can produce geologic maps of the surface of Mars equivalent to the, the maps which you see in a Van McNally. Incredible, McNally incredible. And that sort what, of what's the uh, dimension of that square? Uh, that square, well, the crater itself is 28 kilometers in diameter, so it's about 20 miles across, and it's about three miles deep, with a mountain, the red bit in the middle, is just over a mile high sort of thing. And you know, measuring these dimensions, not only the width, but how deep it is, how high the central mountain is, how high the rim is raised above the surrounding terrain, that actually tells us a lot about the geologic process that formed the crater. And so when we send a rover to the surface of Mars, we better understand, oh, if you see a crater that's this size and the rim is only a third of the height, the one shown here, then it's a very eroded crater. So you, you get further information about the landscape. Uh, simply by looking at the topography. And that's why those topographic maps are so important. And just for completeness, if we go to the final slide here, um, again, I won't bore everybody by going through all of these, but this is the level of detail that one normally follows. You see all the little colored squares well, on the left-hand side. The map, it's yeah. the legend for the map. So we divide the map into you know, different materials, target, ejector, crater, floor materials. And then also you've got a brief description and an interpretation. Now the description should never change, but the interpretation as you have more detailed yeah, information. You learn more. You learn more, you change your ideas. So this is the sort of uh, the direction in which a lot of the mapping, not only of Mars, I'm trying to get a proposal together to map a volcano on Venus with 1994 data and hopefully there'll be better data of Venus over the next few years. And so I'd have to change my interpretation. But the basic description of the landscape should remain the same. I'd still call it a volcano, for example, or a meteorite crater, or a river channel, or something like that. So whatever we learn from, well, whatever planet it is, whatever topographical formation it is, we can apply that to better analysis of, of all that we can see. So the, the rules 
are the, still the rules. The are, rule, they're still learning the rules. The, the, well, the rules and the methodology, while they evolve, basically remain have remained the same since the, the late '60s with the first Apollo missions, for example. And we're starting to learn how, say, if you were to map Pluto, dwarf planet Pluto, or you're looking at one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, what some of the idiosyncrasies are of each of those worlds. But you're still mapping, basically, what's young, what's old, where, is the, where do you draw the line, literally, to, to separate the two, which data sets, whether it's a thermal data set, topography, a regular camera image, compositional information, radar, all of those data sets really help you better define it. And so the, the key thing that we do at UH is basically try and decide what are the optimum set of measurements to make for volcanoes, for meteorite craters, or whatever. Test them in Hawaii, fly them on aircraft, hopefully get them into space, and then we'll be better prepared for the next generation of spacecraft. Fabulous, Pete. I want to be there. You me and too. me, we'll go. We'll All take right. a drone. <laughs> the drone I give you on your birthday. Sounds good. <laughs> That's Pete McGinnis Mark, uh, researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, HIGP, the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, SOAS at UH Manoa. Thank you so much, Pete. Thank you, sir. Aloha. Always Until a next pleasure. time. Always next time. A All right. <laughs>